On behalf of Allergy and Asthma Network, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the June edition of our 2018 webinar series, Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Gary Fitzgerald, the network's senior editor and communications strategist. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Our webinars are tied to our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. The goal of our webinar series, which is also brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, is to share guidelines-based information and resources with you that are relevant to your life and your practice. Today's topic is atopic dermatitis, and Dr. Whaley Song joins us to address important, important management strategies. Dr. Song is the managing partner of Al Alabama Allergy and Asthma Center. He is also the medical director of the Clinical Research Center of Alabama. Dr. Song volunteers as a clinical associate professor in the Pediatric Allergy and Immunology, Immunology Division at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is a native of Birmingham, Alabama and graduated from the University of Alabama School of Medicine. He completed his residency at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut and remained at Yale for his allergy and clinical immunology fellowship training. While at Yale, he did research on the development of pediatric asthma at the Yale Center for Perinatal Pediatric and Environmental Epidemiology. Dr. Song and his wife, Lori, have a daughter and son, Katie and Will. He enjoys playing tennis, watching baseball, following politics, camping, and doing home improvement projects. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Song. Now I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And I hope everybody can hear me well on this webinar. And I hope you're all having a good summer. Um, again, I want to thank the Allergy and Asthma Network for inviting me for giving this talk. Um, it's been fun um, putting this all together. Um, I became, um, as a fellow, I became interested in asthma development. And we, and it's been, been fun watching the science um, get better. And we know that atopic dermatitis is a major risk factor for um, uh, development of allergic asthma. So we now are quickly realizing that um, most um, atopic dermatitis and allergies are closely associated with each other. And our, one of the things about my career is I've been able to participate in a lot of, in a lot of the clinical trials in atopic dermatitis. So that's how I got to become involved um, and kind of passionate about atopic dermatitis. So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to start with the definition of atopic dermatitis. Um, we're going to uh, do a little brief appreciation of the impact of atopic, dermatitis, atopic dermatitis on the quality of life. We'll talk about diagnosing atopic dermatitis. Um, we'll talk about the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis and the inside out, outside in, and um, maybe even both theories of pathogenesis. Uh, then we're going to talk about the basic management of atopic dermatitis and then the complication of severe AD and then the new and future therapies for AD. So eczema um, is from Greek origins. It means to boil over. It is actually a general term um, for that broadly applies to a range of persistent skin um, conditions. Any dermatitis conditions with characteristic um, clinical features of redness, swelling, itchiness, dryness, flaking, blistering, cracking, or oozing could be uh, called eczema. And most people don't realize, um, often people interchange AD and eczema together, but atopic dermatitis is a subset of eczema because there are other, sub, other eczema subtypes, which include contact dermatitis, subarachic dermatitis, and stasis dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis prevalence is up to 25% in children and 7% in adults. Um, 
this is kind of a busy slide, but I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the effects of atopic dermatitis on children and parents. And these are just um, complaints that you hear from children and parents about who suffer from atopic dermatitis. So it obviously can deal with their physical health, um, the itching and the scratching, um, sleep disturbances, um, painful and irritated skin. And then for the parent's side, they're exhausted and tired and they're sleep deprived dealing with a child who's constantly um, scratching and itching all the time. It obviously Im impacts your emotional health. Um, you can have um, behavior and discipline plot problems, crying more, you getting very frustrated as a child, you hate taking medicines, you become hyperactive, irritable and fussiness, you can get restlessness. As a parent, you just feel like helpless, disappointed, um, you're just frustrated, um, sad, um, depressed. You kind of blame yourself for having a child with uh, suffering from atopic dermatitis, and you worry about um, self-esteem, self making friends, cost of care, and things like that. You can also deal with physical functioning. So you're for the child, they're having clothing restrictions. You have to hold the child's hand because of scratching. You alter your routines, um, play routines, swimming routines, bath routines. Um, as a parent, it affects your work, uh, affects work performance, family photos. Um, the family has to stay at home. You're reluctant to leave your child and you have a lot of time consuming treatment re, um, treatments. And then obviously social functioning. As a child, you could have um, adults avoid interaction with child, um, other children avoid interactions with other children. This is a nice study on the impact of atopic dermatitis on adults. Um, as you can see, um, sleep is one of the biggest disturbances um, that people, that adults have. And then also it, um, it can also impact their leisure and social and their work and housework and, and work and study. And then these are the percentage of people, uh, pr uh, patients reporting problems. So obviously pain and discomfort um, is um, a big part of atopic dermatitis and then depression and anxiety, which I think is a very underappreciated aspect of atopic dermatitis. And then obviously it can impact um, uh, your usual activities. So here are the diagnostic creature, uh, criteria for atopic dermatitis. Um, this is the essential features. Um, both must be present. You must have puritis and you must have an eczema uh, looking rash. Um, it could be subacute looking, um, acute looking or chronic looking. You have the typical morphology and, and age specific patterns. Uh, in infant and children, the, um, the pattern could be in the facial, neck and extensor involvement. At any age group, you could have involvement of the flexural lesions. Um, it generally spares the groin and axillary re regions. You can also have a chronic and relapsing history. And these are some important features, um, which is, includes early um, age of onset, A to P, um, personal and family history of A to P, IgE reactivity, and xerosis. And as you can see, this is a very subjective criteria. And it's and unfortunately, there is no like uh, lab marking lab work that we can use to definitively diagnose atopic um, dermatitis. Because of that, um, you definitely need to rule out these conditions, especially if you have treated um, atopic dermatitis and it's not responding like atopic dermatitis, and you really need to kind of go back and look at, um, could you have missed something? Um, so scabies, psoriasis, seborrheic derm, Contact dermatitis is also an important um, thing that you don't want to miss, either irritant or allergic. Um, for, for me, I picked up a couple of CTCLs um, uh, because, again, they weren't acting like um, your typical atopic dermatitis. Um, and then we've also picked up some um, dermatitis herpetiformis. And so, and don't forget your immunodeficiency diseases. So these are all the things that you need to um, be on the lookout. Um, uh, make sure that you don't miss these things. So 
physical examination description is becoming um, much more important that we have to document very well um, atopic dermatitis. There are several new treatments and um, a lot of insurance companies are now wanting you to document atopic dermatitis very well. Um, from what I've seen, um, you should be documenting, um, you should qualify the severity of atopic dermatitis. Um, so what I mean by qualifying the severity is you can just use terminology like clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, and severe. This was based on a um, clinical um, trials investigator tool called the Investigator Global Assessment, or IGA. And you will see IGA in a couple of the studies that I'll show later on in this talk. Um, again, this is a very subjective assessment, um, and you based it on your representative lesion on the body. So if you have even just one little spot, like on behind the knees, that is severe, this person is considered labeled severe. And the way you look at um, the lesion is you judge it by erythema, the excoriation, papulation, and lichenification. And I will show you pictures on all four of those um, in a few minutes. You also need to probably just start describing the, uh, the body surface area. So nothing's exact, you just need to kind of approximate. And one good rule of thumb about how do you measure body surface area of eczema is um, one area of, uh, of the patient's hand is equal to 1%. So sometimes if I need to get a, a good sense of surface area, I just look at a patient's hand and then um, kind of see how much of the eczema um, is, does it cover the one area of the hand. Um, you will probably also need to start document severity in specific um, body areas. Um, for example, like I have patients who have severe atopic dermatitis only on their head and neck, and their their quality of life is absolutely miserable. And they often say, I wish I had it everywhere else except for my head and neck. And so if you are able to document certain areas that are really affected by um, eczema, then that will also help you probably get um, uh, some treatments approved. So this is um, severe erythema and severe excoriation. So as you can see, um, the severe erythema, you have bright red, um, and, then excor and then you can start to see dots um, uh, with the excoriation. And then obviously with severe excoriation, you start having um, breaking of the skin. Um, this is severe populations. Um, so what I often do is kind of, uh, if I want to, feel the papules, this is something to best be appreciated by touch. And you can just um, brush your hand over the skin and you can feel the papules on the skin. And then this is obviously uh, severe lichenification and dryness. You get the hyper, you get the, the severe um, deep markings of the skin. And then obviously you can get the lichenification, the toughness and, and the dryness look of the skin. So we're going to start talking about the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. Um, here is one theory, which is the outside-in theory. Um, and, as, and one of the reasons why you need to understand pathogenesis is because the more you understand the pathogenesis, the better you'll understand um, the new therapies and where they actually target. So the outside-in uh, theory starts off with an impaired skin barrier, um, and it proceeds, um, which precedes the atopic dermatitis, and is required for immune dysregulation. Um, skin barrier disruption causes an increase in immune inflammatory responses, especially Th2 responses, and we'll dis and we'll talk about Th2 responses in a few minutes. Um, Filagrin um, is the, is, is, plays an essential role in skin barrier function and skin mo moisturizing. And loss of function um, mutation in filagrin or downregulation of filagrin um, tends to be uh, a, a big issue. But many atopic dermatitis patients do not have problems with filagrin. Um, there also tends to be defective keratinocytes, um, antimicrobial peptides such as defensins and um, 
um, cathelysins, and um, and these peptides obviously can destroy um, microbes on the cell, um, the, the, the skin surface. So continuing the outside-in theory, um, then you start having skin barrier breakdown. So not only do you have scratching and the physical trauma of the scratching, um, you have reduced levels of stratum cornea, um, the, the lipids, um, the, such as ceramides, and skin barrier proteins. You have um, imbalance of protease activities, um, reduced expression of tight junction proteins, um, and increased transdermal water loss. And so, as you can see here, the stratum corneo and the tight junctions have a defect, and that allows all these allergens, microbes, pollutants, and irritants to go in and be presented by the dendritic cells. So the second type of theory is the inside-out theory, and that starts off with an inflammation, particularly a T cell helper 2 or TH2, um, is a um, systemic process. This systemic inflammation, the inside um, part, is um, weakens the skin barrier, which is the outside part. And this systemic inflammation um, has influences by allergens and by um, uh, microbes. So sensitization can happen at any mucosal surface and, and depends on and then this inflammation depends on Th2 trafficking to other mucosal surfaces. And then obviously in atopic dermatitis, this trafficking goes to the skin. And then atopic dermatitis is associated with other Th2 diseases. Some people on this talk already kind of know this, but I, um, I kind of like to talk about this because um, surprisingly, we actually are getting bogged down in this terminology. Um, some people like to call it the Th2 pathway. Some people like to call it the Th2 immune state. Um, and some people like to call it the allergic pathway. Um, it's interesting. I, I feel like sometimes I wish we, instead of being called an allergy doctor, I, was, I would be called a Th2 pathway doctor because we're now realizing there are a lot of diseases um, uh, that are based on this Th2 pathway. And here's what I mean by Th2 pathway is you start having a dendritic cell and it gets exposed to allergens. And the, um, the dendritic cell presents these allergens to a naive T cell. This naive T cell with the help of IL-4 will change this, uh, the, the IL-4 will change this naive T cell into a T helper 2 T cell. And this, Th2 T cell will then produce IL-4 to create, um, uh, to help, uh, to help the B cell to create IgE. And also the Th2 cell will also produce a series of um, T helper 2 cytokines that will also affect the mast cells, eosinophils, and basophils. And these are the cells that you see that um, play a role in allergy. So we know that Atopic dermatitis plays a huge role in the allergic march. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, food, food allergies and atopic dermatitis ends up predisposing you to developing allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma. And so this is kind of the, what I kind of was doing during my fellowship project was looking at the development of asthma um, between um, uh, under age six and as you can see, um, atopic dermatitis plays a huge role. And I personally think that if you still have atopic dermatitis past um, six or seven years old, it tends to be more um, allergen or allergic driven. We know that, um, that atopic dermatitis is one of the major criteria for developing persistent um, allergic asthma. And here's the uh, modified asthma predictive index, which some um, people who are experts in asthma know. And so if you have a wheezing child less than three years of age, um, if you have this one major criterion, which is atopic dermatitis, your chances of developing um, persistent asthma is quite high. We now know severe eczema is a um, 
is a risk factor for um, development of peanut allergy. And so this is the uh, New England Journal Medicine article on the effect of avoidance on peanut allergy after early peanut consumption. And as we know, if you have severe eczema or egg allergy or both, um, you really need to think about introducing um, uh, peanut allergies, uh, I'm sorry, peanuts uh, sooner rather than later to prevent um, uh, peanut allergies. So there's a third possibility uh, of this pathog uh, of pathogenesis, which is kind of both. And I like to um, think of atopic dermatitis as kind of asthma of the skin. And the more you think about the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, it actually is, I personally think, is, very, is becoming very much very similar to, um, to asthma. So as you can see, um, you have antigens and allergens um, that are also involved. You have a disrupted um, barrier surface, and then you have a whole host of, of media, uh, uh, cells and cytokines and mediators that will um, propagate atopic dermatitis. And so you have um, a TH, you have TH2, you, which includes IL-4, IL-13. You have dendritic cells, atopic dendritic cells that are already um, primed and ready to present um, at their, their um, allergens and to talk with the, the lymphocytes. You also have IL-31, which is also um, which affects itching. And so as you can see, this is all, all involved um, in atopic dermatitis. And so therefore, um, because you have so many multiple inflammatory targets, atopic dermatitis is a heterogeneous disease. And there's going to end up probably being multiple types of atopic dermatitis with multiple types of presentations and also multiple types of response to treatment. Okay, so we're going to pause here, um, and this is my pause slide because uh, we're about to talk about the um, atopic um, dermatitis management basics. And so uh, I don't know how many people have um, know this, but the Itchy and Scratchy show was a, a cartoon within the Simpsons show, and that's where I got the um, title of my talk. So, so atopic dermatitis uh, management basics. Um, this is kind of the way I like to look at eczema and eczema treatment. You have the trigger, and which has itching, rubbing, and friction, and then you develop the eczema rash, and then it basically is break. It's just one big endless cycle, and anytime you have an infection, um, it could be a cold, or it could be a virus, it could be a staph infection that basically adds fuel to this cycle and this and you really need to try to break this cycle. So um, so we will talk about each individual aspects of this uh, of this um, of this series. So first of all, um, management always involves a lot of patient and family education. It is probably the most important and, and it requires a lot of compassion. Just imagine itching every day of your life and for years and years and years and it's and it will take a toll on you physically and emotionally um, and behaviorally. Also um, don't forget people spend a lot of money and time trying to figure out what can they do um, with their skin and make them stop itching. So you need to also educate um, the patient and family about the cause in natural history of the disease. So you need to tell them it, it's likely a systemic disease. It waxes and wanes. So you're going to have times where you're going to, your skin might be doing quite well and you think you might be getting over the atopic dermatitis, but then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you're going to have this flare. And you need to just reassure patients that, you know, unfortunately this is, this is kind of the, nat the natural history of atopic dermatitis. You also need to tell family and patients that it's not the fault, um, it's not their fault, and they're not, um, sometimes patients and families like to blame themselves that they should be doing more um, with lotioning and putting on medicines and stuff. Um, because it does take a lot of, a lot of time and compliance to, um, to 
to treat atopic dermatitis. Um, I have noticed that um, a lot of people try to make their daily regimen too complicated. So I often try and spend a lot of time to how I can make their daily regimen much easier and, um, and also very inexpensive. Um, moisturizing is a priority. And then um, we now have asthma action plans. And so, and you can do step therapy with eczema. So here's um, the one published step, ther um, step therapy um, criteria for atopic dermatitis. So you have the basic management, which involves moisturizing and also once daily baths and showers. And I do emphasize daily because um, there has been a lot of um, old ways of looking at eczema where it says bath is not, um, you should not bathe every day. But a bath is in moisturizing is very important. And then also avoidance of triggers. Um, then if you start developing mild eczema, um, again, skin care is very important. You may want to start looking at bleach baths. We'll talk a little bit about bleach baths and, and antibiotics. And then during acute flares, um, you need to start thinking about a medium to potent, uh, a low to medium potent um, topical corticosteroids two or three times a day for three to seven days to, um, to clear the skin. Then, um, if, then for moderate atopic dermatitis, this is where you also need to start adding a topical anti-inflammatory medication. Um, you can have um, maintenance topical corticosteroids and we will talk about um, the use of topical cortical steroids. Um, low potency is for the face. Medium potency is everywhere else except for the face. Um, you can also use um, uh, picrolimus or tacrolimus um, and as a maintenance. And then also you can use cristobrolol um, also as a maintenance. Then if um, and then if you have a flare, you can use medium to high potency topical corticosteroids. Um, then if for the severe, um, and this is going to be um, what we're going to discuss today, is the severe atopic dermatitis. You can have phototherapy, um, dupilumab, and then uh, systemic immunosuppressants. And then you can also think about wet wrap therapy and even short-term hospitalizations. So skin and hydration and bathing. So moisturizers are the first line of therapy in atopic dermatitis. Um, we, I, I tend not to like to use oils or petroleum jelly, but if a, a patient or family insists on it, they can use it after using their moisturizer. Um, you need to at least um, apply twice daily, um, one after a bath. Um, and, the, and so really after your daily bath, you apply the moisturizer while the skin is damp. Um, you kind of look like a white ghost for about two or three minutes, and then you can watch, tell, the, to the, tell the patient that watch the moisturizer just kind of getting absorbed, and that whiteness will just end up going away. I actually like to spend less time focusing on soaps and shampoos and laundry detergents um, because I really want them to really focus on moisturizing because it really, the more I talk about soaps and shampoos and laundry detergents, it actually starts um, taking away the focus and, and the importance of moisturizing. And it also could be very expensive. And, and I'd much rather them spend the money on a really good moisturizer. Um, you can um, you can also, if the patient has enough time, ask them to bathe three to four times a day, um, and you can um, moisturize and uh, and put a wet towel over um, over the skin and to really try to hydrate the skin. Um, there's some great uh, there was one great YouTube uh, video from the NIH showing how you can just bathe three or four times a day and trying to um, to to, to treat severe eczema. And then obviously you have um, bleach baths uh, for oozing, um, encrusting, and kind of infections. Here's kind of the uh, tip, which is a fourth of a cup for a half bathtub of water, which is approximately 20 gallons, or you can do two tablespoons for a baby bathtub. So topical corticosteroids. So here are my um, kind of clinical pearls. Um, 
Potency depends on the type of steroids in its vehicles. I personally think you should just know one inexpensive, and that's the key, um, topical corticosteroid in each class. And you should know one that you want to use in the low class, medium class, in the very high class. Um, also know which ones has different vehicles, um, creams, ointments, lotions, gels, and shampoos. And then know also the quantity to dispense. And we'll talk about how much you should actually dispense. Um, like I mentioned before, if it is mild, um, you can start with a low potency um, um, steroid, which is especially on your face. In general, uh, you can use a moderate potency everywhere on the body except for the face. Um, and then like we talked about for severe acute atopic dermatitis, you can use a high or very high potency uh, for a brief period. And you should not use high potency corticosteroids on the face, um, eyelids, groins, or skin folds. So this is also kind of a, a, a little pet peeve that I have, is I see a lot of clinicians um, prescribing steroids, but they only prescribe a small tube um, when the entire body is affected. And, and so, but this just shows you, um, this is how much steroid you have to use in an infant, a younger child, and an older child. And as you can see, if you wanna cover the entire body, um, you need almost 350 grams of, of steroids to, um, to do a twice a day application for a 14 day period. So do not start prescribing 30 gram tubes in a severe eczema patient that is covered um, all over with severe eczema. Um, you really need to be, um, to give them enough because there's nothing worse than trying to, um, I mean, squeeze a tube and get every less ounce of, of medicine, and it only covers like um, like the hand or um, or just the feet. Um, so here's kind of a rule of thumb, uh, uh, another rule of hand. As we talked about, one adult hand is equal to one percent of the body surface area, which is equal to 0.25 grams of medication, and so for one application. And then, it, which is about a pea size amount of medicine. Um, I personally like to treat eczema until it's completely gone. So, if it takes almost six to eight weeks, um, then I would, I'd like to, um, then it takes six to eight weeks. I want it to be completely gone because it really, if it's only, if it's 95% clear, in my experience, just that 5% left um, can easily start flaring again. And so I am initially during that six to eight weeks very less concerned about um, side effects of topical steroids. Um, and I'd rather them use the steroids in, for the first six to eight weeks and get the eczema and the rash and the atopic dermatitis to completely go away and, and see if we, I can manage it by lotions. Um, like I said, I often see uh, parents and families stop their corticosteroids too early and they end up flaring and they keep, you know, over a year to two year period, keep spot treating with topical corticosteroids when they could have easily just, you know, knocked it all out in six to eight weeks. Um, so here are two more um, topical calcium urine inhibitors or TCIs in topical crystal bro um, bolo. Um, TCIs um, inhibit calcium urine, thus prevent um, the nuclear factor of activated T cells, NFAT, uh, from being phosphorylated and stop it from entering the nucleus. And it works by altering gene expression and suppressing production of inflammatory cytokines and T cell activation. Um, topical cristobolol inhibits um, PDE4 and thus preventing the downregulation of cyclic AMP to AMP. And then this will eventually, um, uh, this increases the level of cyclic AMP and suppress, suppressing the activity of NF-kappa B and NFAT and other pathways responsible for inflammation and cytokine production. And so that, that's how these two um, topical treatments work. 
So TAS, um, TCIs, um, that there are two on the market, which is tacrolimus and picrolimus. Um, they use in kids uh, greater than two years old. There's no skin atrophy. Um, it's okay to use in the face and eyelids. And the black box warning is what kind of made their use um, go down um, because there is a black box warning and it says um, for um, a rare cases of malignancy, which is skin and, and lymphoma. And um, the American Academy of Dermatology did a review on this and other, and so they do not support the box warning. So they um, tend to disagree with this box warning. Um, topical chrysobolol um, is used for mild to moderate eczema um, or atopic dermatitis. And you can see that um, the patients uh, with an, a two grade improvement in their um, IgA, so um, went from, um, you can see the improvement for Cristobolo versus vehicle. Um, you can see that this effect happens within seven to 14 days. And then as you can see, 51, um, about 50% of of patients um, had a IgA that was clear or almost clear. Then also you can do uh, wet wraps, and I am a big proponent of wet wraps. Um, so what you do first is you do a bath, um, you, do, you apply the treatment medication, you apply moisturizers, then you do a, a, a wet layer, and then you can do a dry layer, you can and that dry layer could be like um, uh, plastic wrap, um, another set of dry um, uh, clothing, and um, and then you let them the the wrap sit, especially overnight, and that will aggressively moisturize the skin. And it also does another thing, which prevents the person from itching that area um, at nighttime. So we talked about the rash, and now we're going to talk about um, itching and rubbing and friction, and also the triggers and the infections. So again, you need to try to break the itch scratch cycle. So I, you obviously try to keep the fingernails cut close. Um, you, I use antihistamines for anti-itch and sedative effects. Um, the sedating ones are really um, good at nighttime um, because most of the itching is worse at night. So the hydroxazine, ciproheptadine, diphenhydramine, and doxepin. Um, the non-sedating and long-lasting ones, such as cetirizine, fexofenadine, and levocetirizine, um, I definitely like to use. Um, it there, and if you look in literature, it tends to be controversial. Some um, the literature says that it, it usually does not help with itching overall or atopic dermatitis overall. But for me, it tend I don't think it it doesn't hurt to use them, um, especially um, if you want to have some itching control during the day. Um, and then also, because the tyrosine is very inexpensive now and it's all over the counter, it definitely does not hurt to you to try to use a non-sedating antihistamine. So here are the factors that trigger atopic dermatitis. Um, obviously, you can have the irritants um, in uh, fabrics, soaps, detergents, cosmetics, disinfectants. Um, you can have micro antimicrobial agents such as Staph aureus. Um, obviously, you have stress. Um, this is not a topic for, um, this is not a time to discuss um, food allergies and atopic dermatitis, um, but cow's milk and eggs do, uh, for some people, uh, for some infants, do play a role. Um, and air allergens in pollen are also um, a um, trigger and triggering factor for atopic dermatitis. So the next two slides are gonna talk about the complications of atopic dermatitis. So you have um, infections. Um, and obviously, um, Staph aureus is the number one organism um, that um, is implicated in, 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 in skin infections in atopic dermatitis. Um, bleach baths can definitely help. You can try intranasal um, mupiracin twice a day for a month. You can try topical antimicrobials that are over the counter, such as mupiracin and polymyxin bacitracin. And then for the widespread infections, um, you can do Bactrim, clindamycin, um, 
uh, cephalexin, erythromycin, and amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Um, it is controversial, um, but in really severe atopic dermatitis, is you're kind of throwing everything at it. So I have seen um, people do extended courses of um, in of of antibiotics, and also maybe even using antibiotics um, to prevent atopic dermatitis flares. Um, other ones that you see. Um, uh, other viral infections that you see in atopic dermatitis include um, molluscum contagiosin and herpes simplex. And um, you can also get human papilloma vi uh, pap papillomaviruses, um, tinea, and candida too. So another complication that I wanted um, to make people aware of is, um, is atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Um, this um, is, as a board question, I remember having to learn all my types of con um, conjunctivitis, and um, and don't and I was always told that every severe atopic dermatitis patient should have an eye routine eye exam, because um, with um, atopic keratoconjunctivitis you can easily get keratoconus, uh, which is the constant rubbing of the cornea so that you start shaping it as a in, until it becomes like a, a point like this. Um, you can have corneal ulcers and then Horner's points, um, which you can kind of see right there. Um, so this had always been recommended to get an eye exam, even before the approval of dupilumab. And, and it actually became um, pretty, um, um, with, with treatment of dupilumab, one of the um, noted side effects has been a worsening of conjunctivitis, and um, which eventually um, ends up getting better um, while on the dupilumab. But, um, but I just want to remind people that you really make, need to make sure your severe atopic dermatitis get a routine eye exam. So we're about to go into um, the immunosuppressants. And so this is another fact about the itchy and scratchy show. And, um, and so let's move on. Um, immunosuppressants and immunomodulators before 2017. Um, obviously we, we had oral steroids. Um, you had cyclosporin and tacrolimus. You have methotrexate, um, hydrochloroquine, um, phototherapy, and then immunotherapy has been used in atopic dermatitis, and it is actually one of the indications in the um, immunotherapy practice parameters, so that you can use um, uh, immunotherapy for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. And then um, omalizumab has also been tried, um, but the results have been inconsistent. So here are the um, the the currently the monoclonal antibodies are that are used in um, clinical trials right now. Um, all of the red, um, the all of the cytokines that are um, in uh, boxed in red are the potential targets for um, for atopic dermatitis. Um, we're going to end up focusing on IL four and IL thirteen. We're going to also talk about IL thirty one too. Okay, so dupilumab is the first um, biologic um, approved for the treatment of a moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Um, it is an, um, a human monoclonal antibody against IL-4 receptor alpha. And as you can see, this is the IL-4 receptor and this is the IL-13 receptor. Dupilumab um, blocks the, um, the 4 receptor alpha the IL-4 receptor alpha, and um, both on the uh, 4 and 13 um, receptor, and so therefore it prevents um, IL-4 and IL-13 from um, um, from binding. So you can see um, there were um, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, there were two 16-week placebo-controlled trials enrolling adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and they were effective in treating. Um, eczema. So here, as you can see, um, 
uh, IGA score um, was you see a 40% improvement in IGA score um, in both trials. And then with the eczema area and severity and index, and 75 means 75% improvement on this index. And you can see um, about 50% of patients had a um, had a 75% improvement with their easy score. And then what's interesting is we're now realizing um, uh, more about puritis and how um, there are so many um, uh, chemicals and factors and cytokines that are all involved in, um, in the development of puritis. So as you can see, there are all these chemicals and and molecules here that can and that can turn on um, the sensory neuron, which makes you have increased skin innervation and itching. And then, as you can see on the other side, the sensory neuron will also uh, release um, factors, and that will work on keratinocytes, Langerhans cells, and mast cells to also cause itchiness. Um, we're going to also talk right next now about IL-31, and this was. Nemolizumab in atopic dermatitis it is an antibody against um, the interleukin 31 receptor A. And there was a, a phase two trial that showed reduced puritis in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And therefore, it looks like the IL-31 does play a role in the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. So you can see there's a puritis score at 12 weeks and that you can see a decrease. And then you can also see a decrease um, in puritis scores on, while on nemolizumab. Now, the next thing is that there are um, small molecules that are being assessed in um, clinical trials. We're going to focus. Uh, we talked about the PDE4 um, and before, and we're going to now talk about the JAK stats. Um, here's the JAK stat signaling pathway. Uh, so you have a cytokine such as IL-4 uh, and IL-13 um, binding to the receptor. This activates um, the signaling molecules JAK and STAT, and the and then as it, the STATs get phosphorylated by the JAKs, and then they work on um, on the nuclear um, side of things. So there is one um, published. Um, uh, data on topical um, tof um, tofacinumab uh, for atopic dermatitis, and it is a phase 2A trial. And as you can see, um, this did help with EZ90 and EZ70 and um, EZ50 responses. And so, um, so this is a topical version of a um, of a um, uh, of a JAK inhibitor. And so. I think um, it, it's amazing um, as we understand the, more about the immunology of atopic dermatitis that we now have all of these new um, targets um, and potential drugs um, to, to um, block these, um, to work on these targets. To, and it's just been amazing to see um, all these new drugs that are being developed for atopic dermatitis because literally, um, uh, like literally one year ago, we had pretty much not uh, we had we had nothing innovative for at least ten years, and then all of a sudden we have all these different um, new drugs. And so um, things include, as we talked about, um, IL-4, um, IL-13 uh, receptor blockers, um, PDE4 inhibitors, the JAK um, JAK inhibitors, um, these um, anti-TSLP, anti-30, IL-31. Um, it's just been amazing to watch this area explode. So that concludes uh, my talk, and um, here's a summary of everything. Um, so don't forget atopic dermatitis plays a huge physical and emotional impact. Um, again, imagine every day of your life just itching and itching and itching. Um, atopic dermatitis is a heterogeneous disease. Um, it is mostly a systemic disease with predominantly Th2 inflammatory states, um, but there are lots of other new targets um, that we know play an important role in atopic dermatitis. Um, puritis plays a role. Barrier functions play a role. 
Um, it requires lots of patient education, motivation, and support. Um, again, keep it simple and inexpensive. Um, because of all these new um, potential treatments, we need to start better documenting atopic dermatitis. And like I said, I think we are entering the golden era of AD, AD treatment. And there's some new already approved therapies and there'll be lots of future therapies. Well, thank you for, um, for listening to me and um, I'll take any questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, quite a few have come in. Um, the first one is, can you comment about stress causing an exacerbation? Um, yeah, so, so stress, um, um, it's, so stress can be blamed for a lot. And unfortunately the problem is, is, you know, I can't as a patient, as a provider say, we'll, we'll try to reduce your stress because that, it, that's, it, that's very, very hard to say, but we know stress, um, there, um, can make you probably scratch more um, just to kind of help relieve, relieve the anxiety and the stress. Um, and also stress might even play a, a neural hormonal factor. And we talked about how there are a lot of, um, we're getting to know itching much better. And, and, and I showed you that slide about neurons and, and, and how um, cells affect the neurons and how the neurons affect cells. And so I can see how how stress can can um, worsen eczema. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is why, in particular, don't you recommend petroleum jelly and oils? I believe you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, um, because it's it's mainly trying to moisturize, um, um, and you want to add moisture, moisture, moisture. Um, I don't mind having oils and petroleum jellies. They tend to be better barrier um, barriers. And, and so after you add the moisturizer, I don't mind add, adding a barrier on top of it. Um, like especially on the face um, where it can get, um, especially if you're a child, you can, I mean, if you're an infant, it can get very wet um, uh, very easily. And if you're an adult, um, obviously you, it, your face gets exposed a lot to, to temperature changes and, and um, dryness and humidity changes. Um, so I don't, I'm not recommend, I mean, I'm not saying that you don't have to use oils in, in petroleum jelly. It's just, I think you need to do moisturizers first and then oils and petroleum jelly second. Okay, thank you. Uh, a next question is, when is it time for a patient or parent to see a specialist? Yeah, um, I personally think that if you are um, going to start needing um, steroid, topical steroids, um, and especially if you need a medium dose steroid. Um, and you need it consistently. Um, um, I personally think like in infants, if one of the big questions that I ask is, uh, for infants and toddlers is that, have you needed a steroid cream? And even like mild steroid cream um, is, is um, mild steroid cream use does give me a red flag um, that, hey, maybe I need to start thinking about referring that person. So it's, it's mainly steroid use, um, I mean, steroid cream use. Okay. Uh, next question. We have time for a couple more. Uh, you mentioned uh, eczema action plans. Uh, can, this, can these be used in the school setting? And what kind of orders should I expect in the school setting? Uh, oh, yes. You can definitely do it in a school setting. Um, I think a simple... Um, eczema action plan that I envision in the school setting is frequent moisturizing. So um, you want to moisturize at least twice a day, but I can see, you know, especially in a school setting, you may, that, that might be bumped up by another additional time during the school day 
one or two other times during the school day. Then the other plan could be um, using um, steroid cream. So sometimes if the eczema is severe and they need a, um, a, 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 a round of steroid, uh, steroid creams during the school day, that's also a possibility. And then I've seen um, some really good school nurses even do a little bit of a wet wrap on some small, small places during midday. So, so those are the kind of things I can see how you can do a step up therapy at school. Okay, we've had quite a few questions um, addressing this, and I'm not sure you can, uh, Dr. Song, you can make a recommendation on a moisturizer, uh, but uh, that's the question many are asking. What? Um, but so maybe you could address like what uh, patients and parents can look for in terms of finding an effective moisturizer. Yeah. Um, so my the way I um, I tend to go to the National um, Eczema Association. They have a very good list of moisturizers. Um, you're right. I, I can't recommend any particular moisturizer, um, but that is where I've, um, I've found to be um, um, the, probably the best site. Um, I can tell you there's about two or three that are very common all over the counter that could be used, and, and you can see that in, on, their recommend, on their list of moisturizers. And, and they're very easy and, and fairly inexpensive, and that's kind of what my, my recommendation recommendation. Okay, very good. We are ab about out of time. I want to thank you, Dr. Song, for speaking with us today and thank everyone for listening today. Be sure to register for our July webinar on July 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern when Dr. David Kahn will be sharing information on chronic urticaria. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigation bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. You can also view our archived webinars on this page on our website. Uh, visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also, access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. For the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, this is Gary Fitzgerald. We wish you a great and healthy day as we work to breathe better together.